I am so excited for you to check out this episode of Nessa Off Air. We have the amazing Latham Thomas joining us. She is a doula and the founder of Mama Glow, which is a nonprofit organization committed to reproductive justice and birth equity through education, advocacy, and the arts. Since this interview was filmed, Mama Glow has opened up the Soft Space in Brooklyn, which is a 2,300 square foot wellness, education, and live event oasis in the heart of Williamsburg, Brooklyn. I am so excited for everything that Latham and Mama Glow is doing. They are incredible, brilliant, and just I'm obsessed with them, okay? I hope you enjoy this episode, and I hope you learn from it, because I know I did. Here we are chatting before the cameras are even rolling. Exactly. I'm going to learn so much from you. And I wish you were in my life when I got pregnant and was ready to give birth to our baby. So I want to pay it forward and I want to help others who may not know what to do. Yeah. But are looking forward to the journey, but have no idea what they're doing. That is me. A hundred percent. I love it. So Colin and I were so excited to have our baby. And I just remember thinking, let, you know, we'll figure it out. You know, because I hear different things. Maybe I shouldn't be on Instagram, but (laughs) you hear different approaches. Some people are just like very on top of it. Mm -hmm. Research every single thing. Yes. To the point where, you know, I've seen mom say I, I it was a lot it became really overwhelming mm. then I saw some parents who are just like hey go with the flow yeah and I don't know what I did but I just got through it yeah yeah and I wish you were in our lives at that mm. time but here you are and yeah. we're gonna help so many people and talk yes. about your amazing organization and your expo and everything that you have going on basically dedicating your life to helping us on our journey of becoming a mom. Yeah. Becoming a parent and not knowing what blueprint to follow. Sure. Yeah. So let's jump right into it. Tell me about your company, Mama Glow. Thank you so much, Nessa, first of all, for having me. I'm so glad to be here. So um, I'm Latham. I'm the founder of a maternal health organization called Mama Glow. Um, We're based here in Brooklyn, but it's a global maternal health company that essentially educates people. So um, if you want to be a doula, we have a global doula training program. And that program services, we've trained in since 2018, 2,500 doulas across the country and globally. And so those folks are like in the workforce, supporting families all over the country and world. Um, And so we're so proud of that. And then um, on the other side, we have parents, right, who are coming and who are interested in information and tools and and all kinds of things to support their journey. And so we provide also education and um, live events and activations and things to support parents and also to create community. So um, I would say like, we're really big at community building for doulas Mm -hmm. and care workers and also for families. And that's also what the doula expo is about, um, which I'm so excited for as well, because that's really like a festival. It's like Coachella for birth workers. It's a, a space that we, we use to really like envision a future of what birth could be, you know? And the theme this year for that is birth to the future. Yes. So I'm so excited for that too, because it's an opportunity for us to really lean into possibility, to lean into principles of futurism, Mm. to design something new. And I know you believe in that so much because like so much of what your activism is about is really like creating something that doesn't exist, right? And, and leaning into possibility and always like leading forward with hope. And so we're in the same game. Oh, <laughs> my heart is so happy. I just feel like, why hasn't this been going on forever and ever and ever? Yeah. And how hard was it for you to establish Mama Glow? Yeah. You know, I was... Um, when I was coming up, so my son is um, 19, going to be 20 in July. And I, when I think back to being pregnant like 20 years ago, mm-hmm. it doesn't sound like a long time. But if y'all can think back to 20 years, we did not have cell phones the way we do now. Right. They had like a whole antenna sticking out. <laughs> <laughs> right. And like you would have to, they were like massive. We also did not have texting in the way that we have it right. now. 
um, internet was not what it is now. And so when I had to find my provider, I used um, a telephone book, which for anybody born after 2000, I know it's a relic. It's basically a book that had phone numbers in it that you could call right. for services. And it's this big. And it's, it's giant. Gigantic. Yeah. And yeah. for black people, you sit on them when you're getting your hair hot combed. Um, <laughs> right. It was like a booster seat um, in the house. So or you use it to like you, as a step stool. OK. <laughs> but um, but anyway, so it was like that long ago. Right. Where the information was not what it is today. I feel like people are so lucky now. Right. Because they do have have the access to the internet, you have social media, you have tools to connect you to resources in a way that I didn't. And so then I'm thinking to myself, you know, there has to be a way to like bridge some of these gaps in terms of information. So it's like easier to access. And so that's when I started like, you know, the light bulbs going off about like kind of bridging some of this, like bringing these things together, bringing the resources, the providers and um, the experiences together. I wanted to have an out of hospital birth because I knew that I didn't want to be in a hospital setting. And so I found a birth center and it was on 14th Street. Um, it was called Elizabeth Seaton Childbearing Center. And it was right next door to, um, at the time it was Nell's and it was TI's. Um, and then it was um, the Darby. OK, which was like nightclubs that we went out to back in the day. So my son thinks he was born in a nightclub. Right. right? So but he turned out to be a DJ. So it like it so all it like worked out. Of, right. So it all yeah. like kind of rubbed off. But um, but that like experience of birthing with midwives and being in that space for me was like so transcendent and so transformative. And it was I mean, I had this like incredible experience where I was visited by my ancestors I felt like so empowered when I came out of that experience that I was like, I have to create something. So it wasn't just like how disparate the services were. It was also that I had this amazing experience that compelled me and I felt then called. And it was like, then I was pushed, you know, like it was like a thing that I could not deny at a certain point. You know how sometimes mm -hmm. something is inside of you and it's like you, you're like, OK, let me just like put that on the back burner and it keeps surfacing. It was like that for me. And I had to just answer the call and show up. And then that's how the doula work came. Now, like anything with, with a newborn and, you know, trying to start something new, it was, it was really interesting. It was challenging. But, um, and then I became a single mom when my son was three. And so like building a business, like in that time frame was challenging, <clears throat> but I just felt like, um, I'm a Taurus. We don't quit stuff. I'm a Taurus. So you know we don't quit stuff. Ever. We don't. No, we don't. So it's so like we decide to do something, it's we done. Go. We right? go. Yeah. And then when we decide we're done with it, right? Then when we're done. we when we're done with something, the grass will never grow there. Ever. Right? Ever. Girl. <laughs> Ever. Let the church say amen, y'all. Okay. The Tauruses <laughs> are in the building. Right? So <laughs> yes. we bring the sunshine. Okay. Yes. And we decide when it's done. That's right. But um, but but we also don't quit stuff. That's right. And so that's the I think the tenacity that I had to build mm -hmm. it was because I also don't quit. Right. Like, so even like the naivete and the, the difficultness, sure. like everything was challenging, but still because I don't quit stuff. Right. I wasn't letting go. Yeah. And, then it, and then it turned into something. Yeah. And so I think that that like, you know, again, like when I think about like how like new parents have ideas and people who are like, even if you feel under resourced, right, like it is possible for you to build and it is possible to build also inside a community. What made it um, mm. what made it feasible for me was because I did have support. Like I did have my son's father, his family lives here in New York. And so I had the grandfather, I had like good friends. Like I never had to hire like a babysitter or nanny or any, well, couldn't afford that, but I didn't have to hire that because I did have community. And so I was able to kind of build steps towards the business mm -hmm. um, by having like family, you know, come and support me and in, in, in like creating it. What is a doula? Yes, it's a great question. My favorite question. So doulas are non-clinical care providers that offer emotional support, physical support, education, advocacy tools. If you have a partner, they'll help your partner participate at their level of comfort and educate them and provide them with tools. And then it's kind of like one of my clients calls it having a producer for your birth. Right. So somebody oh. who's thinking through all the little things. Right. And making sure everything's good, like things like, um, you know, do you want, you know, warm, warm cloths or like a, a cold compress on your forehead? Do you want a sip of water? Do you want it to smell like lavender in here? Should we lower the lights? Right. These kinds of things that are mood oriented um, all the way to things like, you know, do you know how to advocate for informed mm. consent, you know, at the time of birth and what kind of questions you might ask um, your provider? Um, 
and even things like, you know, how to respond to interventions, you know, in the birth process. So doulas can be really great um, educators and people who can also help improve on birth outcomes. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of people may already know this, but we are in a maternal health crisis in the United States that disproportionately impacts black birthing folks. And so as a result, you know, we're really vulnerable and we need people who are inside of birth work, who look like us, who can show up and, and help bridge some of these structural gaps and um, and policy gaps mm-hmm. so that we get the care that we need, especially when we're going to the hospital settings that we know can be violent towards us. When you talk about the disparity, how does this happen? There's a bunch of factors. Um, a major factor is uh, systemic racism. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of people will report like not feeling seen, not feeling heard, feeling um, dismissed, feeling ignored, being bullied, being coerced, mm-hmm. um, you know, being underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed, being uninformed. Um, and so those are like sort of general sentiments that'll surface for a lot of black people and, and folks of color. And then when we think about just like white supremacist patriarchy as a structure, then we're also talking about like homophobia, transphobia, fatphobia, ableism, uh, ageism, sexism, like all of the isms that operate inside these spaces, right? So then like everybody's vulnerable if you're not like a cis heterosexual white male, right? So you go into a space like this and you're seen as othered, you know? And so then already like you're the way that your body looks, the way that you, you know, is pathologized, right? Uh, The way that you show up racialized will be pathologized, right? And even though like you have, you may not have like poor health outcomes, you might be, you might be fine. But like, if we look at a trajectory that like we are on because of our skin color, then we are because of race, not because of the fact that we are black, um, because our race is affected inside these systems and impacted, we're impacted on every day by these systems that are essentially working against us before we're born, then it weathers us, you know, experiencing the things that we have on a day-to-day basis that are challenging, that are in the indignities that we experience every day chip away at us Mm -hmm. in a way that we don't realize, right? It's like, I was talking to someone the other day about like how much we, like how much black folks and people of color in experience just indignities, like being followed in a store, being, um, you know, like on a sidewalk, like you, you see me coming, but then you're gonna like it's pretend I'm not there and I'm like jumping off the sidewalk to make space for you, like spatial, you know, awareness stuff that happens all the time that like folks don't realize that they do to us. Things, small things like that up to like, you know, um, people thinking like, you know, that you're the, um, you might be pedigreed and educated and somebody thinks that you're like, you know, the the person that's caretaking the house or, you know, all the kinds of things we experience, right? To being pulled over because you have a nice car, to being like all these things, right? And it's like every little thing chips away at you and you don't realize it's like having like, you know, a thousand paper mm. cuts, right? And so so we're affected. And then when you when you bring that into a space of um, looking at like the social determinants of health, which are the non-medical factors that impact our lives, including like housing and access to housing, access to like you know job security, um, food security, you know access to um, green space, mm-hmm. even right, clean air, like all these factors impact your ability oh, yeah. to get and stay pregnant, and how long you stay pregnant, and if your baby is born healthy mm-hmm. and full term. So the factors that we don't think about that are that are tied to race, um, that are also because of systemic racism, are things like you know living in a polluted area, are things like not having access to. Uh, quality health insurance and insurance apartheid is a huge deal in our country because Mm -hmm. a lot of people are locked out of um, particular screenings and treatments because of their insurance type. Wow. Right. So you don't necessarily know that. Um, And then if you have something that comes up that doesn't get screened, it's something that's treatable, but it comes lethal at the end of your pregnancy. Oh my. These are things that happen to us all the time. Right. And so, so it's more like, there's so many systemic flaws that if you think about it, it's, it has to be by design. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about it, like, oh, it's flawed. We're like, no, it's not flawed. It's actually designed. This is a this is a very clever design that is operating on us in this way. And if it's up to us to also think about how we engage with this system, how we divest, mm-hmm. how we create something new. Right. And so that's why I'm so committed inside of this work. And I know that this is what your commitment is, is like, like, how do we imagine a different future? Like, how do we design something different? Like, how do we bring ingenuity, you know, to, to the space? Because, um, yeah, it's not just like what people say, oh, black folks aren't getting care and they're eating, you know, soul food and it's like their blood pressure is up. And no, it's not because everybody eats the same in the country, in this country, everybody eats the same. It's not food. It is, hypertension if you talk about like you know um high blood pressure hypertension why would we be tense Mm. there's a lot of things happening in this world and onto us that make us tense i can speak right now about stuff that didn't happen to me that has affected me Mm. right that would make me tense Mm -hmm. and so think about that operating on you not only you but the generation before you and then your mother and your grandmother and your great grandmother and then also your patrilineal line. It's a lot. What are you holding on to, it's right? So even with the resilience, you know, I know that we do have like there's obviously like generational trauma that we inherit. We also inherit resilience, but it does mm. it does take it does impact us. And we're such a strong people, but it does impact us. And so I think when we when we try to you know, talk about like, well, what's happening here? Why are the disparities this way? It's like, you can't look at us and tell what we went through. And you can't look at us and tell that we're vulnerable, but we are. And so I really would love for people to reframe the experience of black women um, to be more about vulnerability and softness and being precious because we are actually so vulnerable right now and need to be protected. And that is really like what what doulas can do, you know, like inside this moment with with doulas who are trauma informed and who Mm -hmm. really understand how to show up alongside marginalized people, they can help to bridge some of these gaps Mm -hmm. and they can also help people feel seen in a world that is like not recognizing our dignity and our humanity. How does someone become a doula? Yes. So there's trainings that you can do. I want to also underscore that a lot of people have been doing this work and it's been inside of them. It's been passed down generationally. And so, yes, there are programs like we have one. I'm really proud of our program. But I also want to highlight that there are people who I meet who've been delivering babies and didn't even know what a doula was. Right. And so we just want to honor that there is um, ancestral wisdom and there is a community and collective wisdom that that gets passed down that doesn't necessarily have a credential next mm. to it. So there's that. But you can do a training. We have the Mama Glow Doula Homeschool, which is like an online program that we developed out of COVID. Um, we used to have all of our trainings in person. I can't wait to get back to that again. <laughs> it was so amazing. We actually have one coming up in June um, in the capital region, and that'll be our first in person since 2020. But yes, this, this is a, a pathway where you can do in person, you can do online, um, and there are um, spaces that you can be in with in community with other care providers to learn the skills necessary to support people along the childbearing continuum. And so um, there's a couple different types of doulas. There are fertility doulas, there are birth and postpartum wow. doulas, um, there are bereavement doulas for like abortion or loss, mm-hmm. um, and there are abortion doulas to support people through the logistical um, things that happen around abortion as well as the aftercare. And then there are death doulas who support people in transition into afterlife. So there's like a bunch of people. Wow. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be like different people. It can be one person because I have done all of those roles as a singular doula in the life course for different people in my life. Wow. Yes. So you I can didn't do all know that. this. Yes. I didn't know there was just so many hats to be worn. There's so many hats to be worn, honey. Wow. Yes. How come we don't know this? Why isn't this just something talked about more often? Or maybe this is just a reflection of me and where I've been most of my life of just working and not really researching, conversing in spaces. I don't think it's, I don't think it's your fault like that because so many people don't know because it's, it's like there is a imperative in this country to build systems against caregiving. 
right? Hmm. Like we are not trying to empower people to take care of each other. This is a country that is individualism about, for sure. Yeah, it's individualism, mm-hmm. right? It's like you know, dog eat dog. It's like, let me eat you before you get me. It's like, I got my resources over here. Like we literally have a freaking, (laughs) an entire movement in our, I mean, a political party called conservatives, Mm -hmm. like to conserve for themselves. Like it is about (laughs) keeping for themselves, right? Right. Like we have, like, this is a actual idea, not only a framework, but it is a practice Like, let's keep for us and let's take from them and let's keep them down. And so that also goes, applies to information, right? So we know that like, it would not be advantageous for like everyone to have access to like people in their community to like, you know, support them and having like low risk birth at home. Yes. Because you don't make money doing that, right? And Mm. so the money is in, everything is about following money, right? And so capitalism is, is, is like in conflict with this work, right? Mm-hmm. Because like, how do you extract? How do you extract from people who are like in community and caring for one another and bartering and you know what I mean? Like, how do you extract or how do you scale, you know, this? You can, it's scalable, but there are things about it that human elements that you don't, that, that we have to think about, right? And, and this can lead to burnout. And we see this in our healthcare system now oh. with care workers, right? right. Like nurses and, physicians just dropping out doulas that are like not practicing also um because of that um because of the 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 intensity of the role and all the um, administrative burden and the low pay and all those things but i think that it's by design to have people not understand or to conflate doula work with midwifery or you know because it just doesn't serve like a capitalist agenda i mean i think to a certain degree Mm. it's starting to be like oh if we can figure out a way to just you know, capitalize on this doula movement and professionalize them, Ooh. right? Then it's like, okay, then here we have something, right? Like we can, um, you know, we can we can extract, right? But that they haven't figured out exactly how to do it yet. Um, and now, so, is that do you view that as negative, positive, or a bit of both? I think it's both. You right. know why? Because I think it's good to have some um, organization sure. around people who are so kind of spread out and not necessarily organized or like unionized. Um, but I also think that there should be autonomy and sovereignty. Like if I want to practice by myself, I shouldn't have to answer to the state. Mm-hmm. Um, to, and, and also the state shouldn't be the one to tell me or to tell an organization what you know, are the best, you know, what's the best pathway or what are the best services or are you, what, what educational pathway is best, you know, like all, you know, types of training should be honored. And so I think what does happen is you have people who are at the state level, you have legislators who are trying to figure out like, how do we write policy? How do we write legislation to, um, to help figure out how to pay for doulas or how to certify them and, it's like, it's not, you should have doulas at the table and we could tell you how to do that, right? And so that's the big piece, right? Is having stakeholders in the room, but then also really understanding like why you wanna harness, like what are you trying to harness? Is it around, you know, equitable pay, you know, Medicaid reimbursement? These are things that we think are important, right? But if it's about credentialing, we know that we have so many examples of how credentialing processes have led to criminalization, right? So if if you decide to take information that was in community and then put it behind a paywall Ouch, and, and right. an institution, right? Now suddenly, like I can't access that information, but I have it. Mm-hmm. But now because it's over here and I don't want to comply, I'm non-compliant, I'm, um, you know, I'm operating without a license, I'm criminalized. And so we're like, do we want that for doulas? Do we want people who have to comply with the state? If they don't comply with the state, then are they criminalized for, you know, that activity of operating as a doula who, who was just operating fine, but now because there's like a new overlay and a new system in place, right? So we have to think about like the consequences of displacement um, and people who are already providing this care and who are doing it well, not to disrupt. Because I think there's like a culture of disruption, like this idea of disruption, which I think is like so interesting, right? That like there, it really took off, right? With tech and like disrupting. Disruption is like negative. 
<laughs> like, why are we talking about? No, you don't want to disturb. You want to find a way to like be in harmony with. Like, let me find a way to come in and like, you know, um, be in 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 nexus and community and service of right. Um, in support of like pour in resources to like make something better. But like there's the focus is always on how do we disrupt instead of like, how do we support, Hmm. you know, how do we work in partnership with? And so um, I would love to see people not think about disrupting what's happening, but think about how they can uplift it, how they can pour in resources directly into community directly into care workers, not giving it to like organizations who then use half of it to their budget for their, you know what I mean, operating budget, and then it goes to like, like no, give that money to community um, instead of, you know, like surveilling them and, you know, give them the money. And so I think that that's where we would see a lot of impact if, if like people would come off off the coin and actually invest in community, you would actually be able to see people do more. Mm-hmm. But because there's limited resources, people can only do so much. And so all the, I think all of the, problem solving is inside of our community. You know, Mm. we know how to solve our own problems, but we're also under resourced and a lot of the things that we need to do take money. And so I think we just really need um, that redistribution, right, of resources. Um, We need we need organizations large and also on, you know, federal level too. like, you know, that there's organizations that are like, okay, we want to pour into doulas. Great. Pour into community, though. right? Right. Not into like state programs only. Right. Go and see who is also operating or who have the contracts with the city or state It's going to be local, like tiny people, you know, who are doing that work. And so I think um, I think I would love to see a a shift to recognize the power and the um, really the 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 wisdom right that we have. And like let and like lead from the space of the people who are already doing the work and have been doing it all along. And and then also we need more like opportunities, because I think to your point for your question that I'm finally answering, um, which was about like, how come we don't know is like there's not a lot of this, Nessa. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot of people who are coming into platforms like yours to speak about these things, right? Like, I mean, you provide a space that where we can kind of like do like political, we can do more activism, we can talk about like things that are happening, um, but not everybody's doing that, right? Right, and so, and so we can have this conversation about birth and also like lead into like social justice, but not everybody's doing that. So I think that's why a lot of people don't know because they're just the, like the information, even though it's there, it's not necessarily palatable always. Right. Um, and also because like, look, the algorithm does not care. The algorithm is like, we that ain't trying part. to talk about like black birth and you know, like we wanna talk about other things, like what's sexier? Like this is not, right? So I think that that's another thing too with the internet, like they're not gonna prioritize on Instagram posts about, you know, black maternal health. And so a lot of people aren't learning in ways that they would if Instagram like kept things regular, right? you know, or if the internet was easier to navigate, I think um, at this point. But I do think that there are a lot of resources now. There are a lot of people who have platforms. You're doing this on your platform. I think there's a lot more awareness. Um, I just would like to see more, um, you know, like even younger, you know, distributing the information to younger people so they can know, like, because we have sometimes people like 16, 17 who do the doula training and it's such a great age to get to get to people, you know? Wait, why, 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 tell? You know, because it's like, if you're, if you're 16 or 17 and you're still getting developed in your body, still feeling like, um, still navigating, like, you know, your life as a young person and you're learning about this process. It's like, you're learning before you really have a lot of experiences, hopefully within the healthcare system. You're learning how to like, you know, have sovereignty over your body, bodily autonomy, awareness of like, you know, how to like navigate not only the system, but only like experiences that you might have, relationships you might have, you know, the relationship that you have to your body. But, um, but then you can also like, serve be in service so much longer like imagine people we have some people who started at 17 they're in their 20s now and it's like they've seen so many births and now a lot of them are like approaching the time where they want to have a baby and they've and they feel like ready Mm -hmm. you know what i mean they feel like a little bit more seasoned and so i think um you know getting young people educating them early it could also help them i think in terms of like people talking about like 
you know, pregnancies for teens and stuff. Like if teens understood their bodies, like it would right. be different, right? right? And so, you know, it's like we malign culturally things like teen pregnancy, but then we don't provide children with resources and education and then teens with the with the tools they need to actually be safe, right? right. Um, and so I think that that would be really great. And we are, you know, we welcome young people in the program. We are gonna develop, it's a program for like peer educators uh, in sexual health that we're developing because a lot of folks aren't learning anymore because they've taken it out of the schools. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of work. It is. I feel like there's misconceptions about a doula. I feel like sometimes, for the most part, it's either your team doula or team go to the hospital, right? Yeah. There seems to be a separation. Right. But you can't have a doula if you do decide to go and have your Absolutely. child at the hospital. Your Absolutely. doula can be with you. And I think, uh, can you explain that a little bit further? Because I think sometimes people feel torn when making yes. decisions. That's a great, that's a great comment, Nessa. You know why? Because it is your choice, right? Mm -hmm. as, as a parent, as somebody who's going through this process, the doula is there for you regardless of where you're gonna birth, if it's home, if it's mm -hmm. hospital, if it's a birth center, if it's your car and you Uber on the way, right? right? <laughs> Wherever this baby decides to come, that is, it's your, it's your choice who you have there as a support person. And I would say that a doula is even more important to have in the hospital because there's so many things in the hospital that are happening that you're not prepared for. Mm. Um, in a home birth, the midwife tends to have similar values, right? And is seeing birth in a way that you're probably aligned with. And so you're going to probably feel safety in that situation with the midwife. You're probably going to feel like they understand you. And so, and not saying again, like there's different, you know, I've worked with so many doctors who are great. So it's not to malign. It's really more just like the culture of our healthcare system is one of, it's a hazing culture. Right. And so, um, so yeah, people aren't treated well, you know, inside of that system. And so then, yeah, like when you go in for, care as a patient like you receive some of like what you that first mm -hmm. of the fallout of that culture but you also receive care that is you know that's really just like not even just um like supported but I think it's like also uplifted you know that like people talk a certain way or treated a, a patient a certain way like that's it's like expected as par for the course and it's actually abuse, mm. right, that happens and disrespect that happens all the time. Um, you need a doula in that setting. You need somebody to help you navigate that setting um, to understand like what your rights are, right? What your human rights are. Mm -hmm. What are your rights also as a patient? Um, what is the patient advocacy safety net look like for you? You know, what does consent look like for you in a hospital setting? We need to have conversations about consent in hospitals because people touch you in ways that outside of the hospital would be considered um, assault, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to have these conversations because people who have also experienced, you know, challenges like sexual transgressions go into hospitals and are re-traumatized. <sighs> we have to, right? So we have to have real conversations about like how to how to birth safely and how to birth with dignity and, and um, a sense of belonging. And, you know, being in there with, with a, a doula, being there with the people that you love, you know, can, can help lead us to a better birth outcome. It doesn't necessarily mean that we can control what that outcome is, mm -hmm. but it does mean that um, we can be there to support you with whatever the outcome is, right? We can help you to be able to adjust and to feel good about it and to, um, yeah, make sure that like on the other side of it that we process the birth with you. And there's all kinds of ways in which we support people. But I would say, you know, I love that you brought this up because there's, there, is, um, there is this kind of idea mm -hmm. that like, oh, it has to be one or the other. Right. But it doesn't. You can have a doula for every, and I also say even like C-sections, some people have planned C-sections mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, I can't have a doula. I'm like, absolutely, you need one because you have recovery on the other side. Right. Right. right? So yeah, so I would say that like in that case, people should think the opposite, you know, because sometimes people who are in home birth settings are over supported because they're just people everywhere. Right. Like you got your family, your kids is running around, gumbo on the stove. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's a whole thing. So but then you have like a, a setting where you have like maybe um, a, a birth center. Right. And you can bring some people, you can bring family members, you have your midwife there. 
like you might not necessarily need a doula there. They might have staff. And so it's like, and that's what my situation was. I was in the birth center. I didn't need a doula. I had so many people. So, right. So like a hospital though, you're, you have limited number of people, right? You have two people. And you know what, to the point you were mentioning about the care, because people I feel aren't care workers aren't appreciated. They're not. And you can feel it. Yeah. And it's almost like I do believe a lot of time care workers have the right intentions, but they're in a system that doesn't care about them. Exactly. So now we're expecting them to expend even more energy to overcome the hurdles that they're facing to care for me. That's right. It's hard. It's very hard. And it's not right. And you're a thousand percent like everything you said. This is what we see all the time. right? Right. And so someone like so you might have an experience and you're like, oh, my God, they were so mean to me. Not realizing what that person had dealt Has with gone all through, day, right? what they're experiencing. Yes. So it's very challenging. And it's not fair to it's not fair to the parents. It's not fair to obviously the care workers. It's not fair. So the system has got to change. Right. Um, I fully agree with you. What is the difference between a doula and a midwife? Yes. I love this question. Um, so midwives are clinical care workers and they're trained in a skill set to support um, birth and postpartum, mm-hmm. but they also provide care along the entire reproductive continuum. So you could go to a, min- a midwife when you start menses. They can see you through pregnancy. They can see you through aftercare for abortion. They could see you um, after a baby is born to just, you know, continue your well woman care. They can see you on as you head into menopause. Like they're there for the life course. So you can see them at any juncture. Yes. And but mostly they deliver the babies. Yeah. So they're great. Um, Usually they have skills in um, in other areas outside of um, their their clinical work, um, which might include like herbalism or. Um, healing arts might be part of what they do. Nutrition might be something that they also are versed in. Um, but they're also very skilled in how to navigate the pelvis and understand the position of a baby without having to use um, like a lot of technology. Like they're taught this, um, how to you know really understand the pelvis and pelvic anatomy. They're also, I would say, the midwifery model of care is really different from how our hospital system is set up. So the midwifery system is, here's the family at the center, and then everything is built around them, right? So family at the center, Mm -hmm. and that's where the care starts. In a hospital system, you know, physician at the top, and it's more of like a pyramid structure. Interesting, okay. Yeah, so the family is like not at the top. And so um, midwives are really about like, are responding to the family's needs, um, you know, designing care to, to fit that unique family. And, um, and yeah, and then like following their pregnancy and tracking and all the things that we would do to make sure everyone's healthy, but just really being a presence of support and, um, you know, uh, yeah, just like a, a person who can like be confided in as well in the process. Um, they do not do like, sometimes we have midwives who also practice as doulas, um, doulas who get, okay. Doulas who do get, get educated to, to, to be midwives. And there's levels to midwifery as well. Like there's licensed midwives, there's certified nurse midwives. Wow. There are the different ones who have access to different types of birthing experiences. So some people can birth in the hospital only. Some people can birth outside of the hospital. Some people can't be licensed to birth, to, to do births in their state because of like the restrictions. And so it depends on where you are. There's also traditional midwives who are midwives who got trained in community and don't necessarily have credentialing, but have delivered thousands of babies, right? And so there's different pathways. But um, if someone's interested in midwifery, a good, a good entry point to that is doula because you get to like support people and you get to watch and be a part of the birth journey and in a supportive role that's non-clinical. And then if you want to go through the educational pathway, which for some people is cost prohibitive, which is why they don't go. Mm. Um, But if you want to go on the nursing path or if you want to go on the nurse midwifery path, then that is available to you. How does someone figure out whether the doula or the midwife, like how how do they know? Okay, what's their background? How do I know researching and all that? Mm -hmm. How do like how do we know what are their sites? How do we just? Yeah. 
I mean, it's so personal, right? Yes, it's very personal. You're about to have a child. Yeah. You want to feel safe. You want to feel whoever is around you knows what they're doing. Yes, absolutely. I barely know, right? That's like, absolutely. I'm in this moment. I'm like, well, okay, I just need to make sure that whoever's around me, that you're good to go. So that's right. how do we do the right research? Where do we go? We know that information is imperative, especially yep. where are you looking for the information? Yes. And when it comes to the internet we know you can find anything Girl. to support whatever point you're trying to make and now they got so much stuff out like with the deep fake stuff that i just you like, just don't know you just really right? don't know what you're looking at yeah it's so crazy yeah i would say like for the midwifery you know it's really great to research midwives in your area i love social media for this tool because people will share like oh this is my favorite person um i got connected to a lot of midwives on social actually oh, okay. um which was really helpful um, because like, you know, Instagram, like group stuff for you. So you just end up finding people and there's people who I've never actually met in person that I feel like so connected to. Um, but I think that's a good, a good way to start there. Uh, finding out, um, also from recommendations of folks right. in your area. There are some apps also that aggregate this kind of data where you can go on and learn about experiences from other, you know, families and, and see like what they're, you know, talking about, about providers, um, to get like some intel on like who you would want to hire. There's also, um, you know, databases using some of these platforms. Platforms are interesting because again, there's information there. Right. However, right. you do need to like meet people and see if you vibe. Yes. So the best way I think is recommendation through friends reaching out to people who you respect or vibe with. If you see somebody on social, you're like, I like how they move. Like, let me reach out to them and see if they're taking clients. Mm -hmm. Like just even how somebody expresses themselves, like languaging, how they express themselves socially, like what you might see about like, you know, their practice online, you know, oh, I love the way they did this, or I like this design, right. this is pretty, you know. Sometimes it's just by looks, right? Like you're gonna feel a vibe, but you know, on the looks of someone's website or whatever. But I would definitely say like recommendation is key. Mm -hmm. And then interviewing people, virtual interviews are a really great way for you to figure out if there's something a there. vibe, right. yes, if there's a connection. Yeah. What are some questions we should be asking? Yeah, for which, which for midwives or for doulas? For both. Yeah, so for, uh, I'll start with midwives. So for with midwives, you wanna find out about like, you know, their training background, how many babies they've delivered, um, what are some of their core values, mm. you know, around birth? Um, you want to find out if they do home visits because that's a perk, right? If you don't have to go someplace, oh, yes, huge perk, right? Um, you want to find out like, you know, if they work with a partner, would you be able to meet that partner? You know, obviously what the costs would be. You want to learn about, um, yeah, their values and how they would provide care for you. What aftercare would look like after the birth. Right. You want to find out... Um, you know, what would happen if there was a hospital transfer? What would be the situations that would necessitate a hospital transfer from the home setting? Um, things like this, right? Uh, for doulas, I think you wanna find out like, you know, how recently they took a training, what the training was, um, you know, what, I mean, research also to see like, you know, what, where they were trained because um, not every doula training is equal. And so mm -hmm. you have people who may not be able to support in ways because they weren't provided with information, sure. right? Even they might look like us too, right? So it is important that folks have had like trauma-informed care, um, you know, education that's been trauma-informed, people who've had um, culturally congruent education, people who've under really understand like the unique position that marginalized folks are in um, and can help them, you know, navigate the terrain of the birth um, journey. And so- Absolutely, you wanna ask all kinds of questions about background. Um, you know, you wanna find out also, like, you know, like what their values are, mm -hmm. like if you're aligned in, in terms of value systems, um, because that's also something that you know, brings connection. You know, what relationships they have with certain hospitals, mm -hmm. um, what kind of resources they have in terms of um, their parental resource network, like do they have access to licensed mental health providers, do they have access to lactation providers, like things like this, wow. like what kind of referrals, right, right. they might have for you, um, their referral network, that's very helpful. But really like what they can provide, because there's a lot of doulas who typically, like how service might look, right, is they would contract to do kind of a, a bunch of prenatal visits with you, 
they would support you through the birth process and then do some postpartum support with you, which is great. And there's people who have like other skills. So some people might have, um, oh, I also do yoga or I do meditation or I do cooking or I do nutrition or I do body work. Like amazing. Wow. They can add those things on. So you want to find out, well, what are the other things that you bring to the table? Um, and the biggest question I would ask a doula though is like, what is something special about you that you want me to know? Because there's things about people that you wouldn't realize are so important, you know, to, to service. And, you know, we had um, a cohort of doulas that we trained that were impacted by incarceration. And these people were from all over the world. And one of them had actually had reentered like two days before the training. Um, and when, I, when we asked her this question, it was like, it was so, um, I mean, she was crying to answer mm. the question, but also she was like, oh my goodness, I never had to think about how to position myself, you know, from a, from a lens of like what is special. And I think a lot of us aren't asked or a lot of us don't know what makes us special. And we have to build confidence around the things that are unique about us because a person will connect to that. Right. And so, um, so part of what we do in the, the doula training program at Mama Glow is affirm and build up people and provide them with support, you know, make them feel seen. And, um, and we do a lot of work around healing in the training. It's really mm -hmm. a place that people come, come to heal. Like mm -hmm. they come to become a birth worker, but they come to heal. But I would ask them about like, yeah, like what makes you, what makes you special that you want to communicate to me? Like, what do you want me to know about you? Like mm. when you leave out the door, what do you want me to know about you? Because then it's like, you can, you know, you can get past the like, hi, you know, yeah. I'm here with my I'm resume. This, right. Yeah. Now it's like, no, who are you? Right. Sitting right. in front of me. Right. And then it's that person can come out. And, um, and so I always bring that question in, you know, when I'm talking to people or if I'm interviewing doulas, you know, with a client or something, and then you feel this, oh, I can, I can tell you about myself a little bit. And people like open up. And I think that's what you want. You want connection. If you feel that connection and there's a vibe and you're chirping, amazing, right? right? That's what you want. You want yeah. good energy, yeah. good energy. <laughs> yeah. And you know when it's not good energy. Oh, yeah, yeah, You gotta yeah. listen to that. Yeah. You gotta listen to that. Yeah. Okay, Tauruses are good. We're like, oh. Yep. We walk in a room, we're like, oh no, the energy, we, we out. We, absolutely. Where's my Uber? That the is energy was bad. <laughs> the energy was bad. I can't do it. I'm yeah. out. <laughs> Are there red flags that you're just like, hey, I, of course you love doula work. And, mm -hmm. but again, for someone who was on this journey for me, I just remember being so scared. Yeah. I didn't know what to look for. Mm. I didn't know what is considered, oh yes, that's a good sign. Or this isn't, other than vibing, yeah. are there red flags that we should steer clear from just in general? If you're just like, okay, maybe the doula work, the training should embody X, Y, Z. That's mm. a good thing. Mm -hmm. And of course, like what my red flags are is going to be different than maybe somebody else's. Yeah. But I don't really know, like, what mm. is a foundational understanding of what we should be mindful of that yes. keeps us safe in such a vulnerable time? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and you're right, it is personal, but I think there are some things. Number one is judgment. When people come Ooh, across yeah. and they are like judging and pushy, yeah. like pushing an agenda, their agenda, whether that's your physician, whether that's a doula, whether that's a family member, that's a bad sign, right? I like like that we one, should yeah. not be like a receptacle for people's judgment, right? Right. Um, we should not be taking on people's judgment. And so, um, so yeah, if somebody's coming across and they're like, you know, like judging and, and picking at you, like, no, right? That's a red flag. Um, I think also privacy is very important. And so non-disclosure of details, people who are like, um, oh, yes. you know, keeping information to themselves is really important. Um, people who, I think, you know, people should be chatty and talkative and all that, but I think it's also um, a, a red flag when people like are over familiar and over share very early. Yeah. Um, you have to build trust and, and the, the, the trust building has to start with you feeling trusting with me 
And if I start unloading onto you my life and all this stuff, it's like, that's build it. That's like the opposite, right? Like now you're like creating a safe space for me. How am I creating that for you? So I think you really do want people who also are really good at like creating some space where they have some reserve around the relationship and protecting the boundaries of the relationship and not putting onto you what happened in their day. Right. You know, not bringing in their own personal stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, That's really important. Another thing is um, taking sides. And so inside of a relationship, like if you have a partner or family members or whatever, and you and a doula comes in, like part of what we assess is, okay, where are the sticky points in the relationship that I have to be aware of and have to help navigate? Um, but if there's judgment or not even just judgment, but like, um, like uh, say, take like, oh, like your mom is right or your partner's, like you don't want this either. Because there's gonna be moments also too, like if, you know, and I've been through this with somebody where like, or multiple clients, I should say, where like a partner is feeling a certain way and the other partner is the object of the anger, Mm -hmm. right? And the anger is being directed towards them and I have to be in a space of non-judgment. I have to be in a posture of listening and receiving that and helping to, you know, provide some um, observations, some reflections, some, you know, grace around it. But if I take their side, what happens when they're good? And I already did like, oh, and you know. Right. So you gotta be really like just even and you have to be a support to this person and a support to this person. Have you been in a situation where a person asks you to take a side? Where they're just like, okay, so who's right? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think I've gotten to that. Okay. (laughs) But I have gotten to where um, like somebody will use me as a referee. Oh, no. Yeah, where it's like, oh, you know, like you're in the room to kind of help them feel like, yeah, like I'm use, being used as a tool to like, you know, deflect from what's actually happening. And I have been, I have had that situation happen. And I've had to say, <gasps> here's the perspective. Here's what I see happening. Let's talk, right? But it's not about me, right? I think the biggest piece you want to look for is somebody who's not making it about them. Like if you feel like- That's a good point, If right? somebody's in the center, they should really be here holding this container for you, right? Not, it's me, the doula, right. or it's me, the care provider, right? I'm right. here, right? <laughs> it should not be this, it should be about you. And so you want somebody who feels like they can be a, a constant presence of support. You are not looking for somebody who's here to make it about them. You had mentioned the different hats that doulas can wear. I didn't yeah. realize that at all. By the way, I'm, I'm learning so much. <laughs> at Mama Glow, what? Do you learn all those different aspects or do you guys specialize in something specific or do you provide all the different hats? Yeah. So we focus primarily on um, pregnancy and postpartum support. Got it. So our trainings will be expanding in 2024 um, to include other things. Um, But we yeah, but primarily when people come from the public, they're experiencing the the prenatal um, okay. training, which is level one, or the postnatal training, which is level two. And level two also uh, looks at complicated birth. And so that's what we do in, in this program. We have other programs that we've developed um, with uh, healthcare systems and with um, like healthcare retailers that allow us to touch nursing populations or people who are um, not necessarily professional doulas but want to have access to some of the skills and sure. support you know that doulas provide but they're clinicians and so we develop a tailored program internally for other organizations um, wow yeah which has been great and another thing um, that we've been able to achieve with the program. I developed it like over the years, obviously since 2018, and we've had all these people come through, like thousands of students. Finally, uh, the program is um, in the university, at Brown University, it's embedded as a course. Amazing. Which is so great because I work with, I mean, bioethics students and medical anthropologists and public health and ob Gyn and pre-med and it's been amazing and so um i'm an assistant visit visiting professor of the practice of gender and sexuality so studies amazing. which is so awesome yes and the course is embedded and i get to teach it and so i get to work with young people who are now also challenging the system challenging their own beliefs challenging what wow. they learn inside the institution about healthcare. um 
and rethinking how they want to be inside of the healthcare system. So really investing in the future generations. When you're talking to them, what would you say is their biggest conflict that they have to deal with? Well, one of my students I remember was saying um, that they felt um, they felt like the course brought up questions for them about like, do they want to go down the track of becoming an OBGYN and what would that look like, um, you know, being racialized black? And so they were like, I don't know if I can be in a space like this yet. And I have to like continue down the path to see if it does make sense. And so it was really interesting. A lot of them had different similar things like that. But I think the challenge for a lot of them was that like the material as we're going through it is really it's really hard. Right. You know, for for some of us to take in um, because like you said, like we were talking earlier, like, you know, these things can be interesting. They can be heavy. But um, but also, I think it was really eye opening for so many of them. And so, yeah, so the conflict was probably around like, yeah, like, how do I how do I navigate the system? Also, how do I sort of, you know, think through my approach to what care could look like? Um, And then, you know, and then seeing like examples of things in their own personal lives and how they've navigated healthcare. There was a lot of really interesting, um, I think, revelations amongst the students. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, and, and you're like right so, there. Yeah, and you're right, right there. there. It's just great. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Yeah. So the work when it comes to doula and, and postpartum is that how yeah. do we reference it as postpartum or postnatal? How do postpartum postnatal? It, okay, just yeah. want to make sure that I'm <laughs> yeah, thinking all of that's and right. talking correctly. That's, all of that's right. So what is that? What does a doula do in that phase? Because yeah. I think a lot of times we forget about the postpartum phase. I feel like sure. that's something that I have discovered on my journey mm-hmm. was kind of the focus on, okay, you're pregnant, have the baby, and then that's it. Right, right. No care for, you know, the birthing parent at all. At all. I know. And we're just left out here to figure it out Girl. again. Girl. <laughs> Cray. Right. It's it's so bizarre. And I that's know. I feel like, of course, we need care throughout the entire journey. But it's just we just went through something not just life changing, but our body, our mind, our our spirit. It's yes. it, a lot is happening. Absolutely. So how would a doula help us in that transition? Think about what we do for babies. Right. We we hold them. We swaddle them. We feed them. We change their diaper. We don't leave them alone. Right. For new parents, we need to hold them, we need to change them, we need to feed them, we need to love on them, we need to never leave them alone. Right. We have to do the same. Yeah. And so that's what a doula can do postpartum is swaddle you, is support you, Mm. is to help you through recovery. Because a lot of things are changing, the brain is changing, the body is changing. And these rapid changes are very sensitive and delicate and also lead us to become very vulnerable. And it can lead into things like depression and anxiety and Mm -hmm. overwhelm, right? That can happen in the, in the new parent, in this period of new parenthood. So we need to, um, yeah, we need to adequately support people. And so, yeah, a postpartum doula can come in and be someone who's you know helping you with recovery, helping you with food, helping you get organized in the home, do some light house related you know duties, right. um, but mostly there to like help you build confidence as a new parent and adjust. I think also not understanding how a doula can help in a home versus the idea. Well, the partner should do that. Yeah. The family member should do that. Yeah. And I feel like, why wouldn't you want extra help? Because, I mean, I love Colin, but he doesn't know all the ins and outs of how to help me recover mm-hmm. postpartum. So I feel like there are substantial benefits to have a Huge doula. Huge benefits. And it's not to say that your partner, your family member, whoever is helping you on this journey, that they don't know or they're not willing to help. They just might not know. They just might not know. Yeah. And it's common to not know. Yeah. And it's not fair for us to kind of put people in a position where they're like under supported. Right. Um, Because we leave people. And and again, like I was saying earlier, like we built systems against caregiving. So nobody knows what to do when a baby comes. Right. Yeah. Nobody knows to do when someone passes away. Right. Nobody knows to do when you get sick. 
Nobody knows what to do when there's an accident, right? Like nobody knows what to do. And so we've, this is a design as well, right? Mm-hmm. And, it's a, and it's also something that's aligned with like, you know, capitalism, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's, like it's in service of capitalism that you don't know how to show up for your family. So that we can pay somebody to outsource that, right? Right, and that we can actually continue to extract from you, yep. right? So, um, so I think that like the disservice to parents and families is that we don't have a paid parental leave policy in place hmm. on the federal level Come that you got to go right back crazy. to work. You can't be with your baby, right? Like one in four women go back to work ten to fourteen days after having a child right. in this country. What? What? Imagine like okay, so there's some people what? who bleed for ten days straight. Right. Right. On a period. Right. So imagine, I mean, some people, right? So, so, but here we go. 10 to 14 days. I can think back to when I had my son, like you're still passing fluid, milk is coming, all kinds of stuff is happening. Yes. You're not trying to sit at nobody's desk. No. Right. Uh -uh. So, so just the, the fact that this is how we think about families. This is how we prioritize families in this country should tell us everything we need to know. That's right. Right. That's right. We shouldn't need a person to step in. We hmm. need we need doulas and we need postpartum doulas, birth and postpartum doulas. We need abortion doulas, but we need these people because there are policy gaps mm-hmm. and legislative gaps and systemic gaps mm-hmm. that that lead people to a place where they're by themselves and they're falling through cracks. Mm-hmm. That's why we need us, right? Like not because everything's going well, right? We need them because the system is not providing support and because our nation does not prioritize the needs, especially the needs of birthing individuals and families. Um, It is not particularly thinking about, even though it's like on the federal agenda, you know, black maternal health, if it was white people, we would have solved it. Hmm. We wouldn't be talking about this, right? So. We need these people because they, they feel a unique need outside of our system that, um, that is getting met. Yeah, so I encourage people to, to think about like what it would look like, even as we talk about it too, I know we didn't talk about affordability, so I do wanna say that it, oh. it, it can be affordable, right? There are community-based doulas who work on a pro bono basis. Oh, wow, um, there this are is people. great to hear, by the way, because I think once people start hearing, oh, more this, that, they start thinking money, okay, money, 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 yeah. money. There it's are pro bono, right. right. There are pro bono, there are people who work on a sliding scale, there are people who take, um, wow. you know, take your fee after or do payment arrangements and bartering. There are people who also work within the state so they can do Medicaid reimbursement. There are some, some insurance companies are reimbursing for doula care. Um, It's different by the state. So you have to look and see, Um, and it's work. Like you have to search to get these answers, but. And um, that's by design to make it harder for you to get the information. Boom. Exactly. That, That part, that part, they really make it so hard. That part. Yeah, they make it so hard. Yeah, it could be so easy. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because everything else seems to be easy. Everything else does. A- anything that has to deal with, you know, destruction. The war machine. Or anything. You could, it, it's easily accessible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Absolutely. <laughs> so when someone comes to Mama Glow, mm-hmm. is it just, would you say it's filling a gap between people who want to find a doula Mm -hmm. or those services and also training people who want to become doulas. So can I, at me, who's someone who just got pregnant and I'm just like trying to figure it out, would I go to Mama Glow and be like, okay, let me see what services they provide. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that's really important to know that it answers a lot of questions and not just only to train people to become doulas, but we can come there to get just direction on what we need in yeah. general as yeah. the client. I'll say the client. Yeah, but the client. You get what I mean, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. There's content. There's doula support for you. We can help match you with doulas wherever you are in the country. Um, absolutely. This is yeah. so amazing. Yeah. I really wish... I, I didn't do good enough research. I That's really okay. wish I there's, did better there's, research. There's other opportunities. <laughs> oh, absolutely, for sure. <laughs> but you also have an annual event. And yes. you put this expo together. And, you know, my background when I first came up in radio was event planning. Yep. You know, whether it be summer jam shows or yep. whatever. So I understand event planning at a 
different level. Oh, girl. And I really appreciate what you're doing. And I just want you to know, it's not just like what we see, but it's everything that happens behind, behind the scenes. Yes. My love and my heart is with you. Thank you so because much. Because you're putting on an incredible event for so many of us to benefit from. Yes. What is the purpose behind your event and why yeah. is it so important for you and why should we be there? Yes, oh my gosh, thank you. So the Doula Expo by Mama Glow is a culture shifting event. It is a two day festival at Hudson Yards and what it is for us is a celebration of doulas, of care workers, of families. Uh, we bring together people from elected officials to folks who are in the healthcare, to birth workers, to families, um, brands and organizations, and they all come together with the same purpose of wanting to improve maternal health, but also to think in a different way about it. Right. And so I like to think about it like we're here to envision a different future. That's right. We're here to lean into principles that mm -hmm. allow us to expand our minds and be in a, a posture of ingenuity and and problem solving and um, yeah, and also just like celebration. So it's a festival, it's celebratory, it's, um, we got DJ Rashida who's spinning, we got um, Tatiana Ali who's emceeing, and so amazing. just like it's moms, I gotta get you there next year, <laughs> yes, yes, okay? Yes, I gotta get yes, you there next year. Yes. Um, and, and yeah, and it's just gonna be this like, it's just a wonderful way to celebrate, to um, honor ourselves, to be in community. Mm -hmm. um, lots of doulas meet there, people meet their doula there, oh, like it's so really cute. Oh yeah. my goodness. Yeah. And you don't get tired of the work? No, I'm gonna be tired after this event. But, yes. <laughs> but you know what it is? I um I feel I get so much I get fed from teaching. You know, I, I feel really charged. I didn't know that I was gonna be um, you know, as a professor and then also teaching and facilitating outside of the university and just like in community, I never knew that I would be so um charged by that. Hmm. I didn't know. And then I started doing it, I was like, oh, I love to teach. You're incredible at it. Oh, thank you. I can, I literally, I'm like, can you just talk to me all day and night and just, I just want to just you. be around you all day and night. Cause it's look as a tourist girl, when we vibe, when we feel when we vibe, someone, we freaking vibe. Yes. And like, we just connect, we're attached. That's, That's it. it. That's it. Can't do nothing about it. You can't do nothing it. about it. It's done. Are you going to write more books? I am going to write more books. I brought you some books. Oh, I am going to write more books, but you know, um, it's like, it's so much work. It's like it having is. another baby. It's a lot of Girl. work. Girl. Yeah. So that's on the horizon, child. Let me, let me talk about that in 2024. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have a, you have such an amazing journey and I, I admire you so much for Aww. doing the work that truly matters Thank and you. caring for us and really trying to help us understand the importance of loving ourselves, the importance of breathing and Girl, taking breathing. a moment. Mm. And key, right? You know, and just figuring out that, okay, I might have to shed some old ways of thinking and viewing the world and That's like right. realizing there's a different way I can live that is beneficial and celebratory of everybody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not easy. It's not. Because. We get it done. You know, because it's this idea of, I think people feel like, oh, it's like this it's purity, right? Mm. And it's like, no one's perfect, right? We're yeah. all learning. But as long as we're working towards that and actively trying to figure out how to help others yeah. versus doing anything harmful, mm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and that work is a lot of work. It is. Because you have is. to face things that maybe you don't want to face. Maybe you thought you were doing something that wasn't harming somebody else. But mm. I think even when I, after having a baby, I realized that with Colin, I was just like, wow, our baby just has completely changed everything. And yeah. you hear this, you know, from parents in general, like, yeah. oh, your whole life changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it really does. It really does. Yeah. It and so for the better. And I just, I feel like if I go down this journey again, I hope I have the right support mm -hmm. so it could be communal. Yeah. I love I, that. I really love that the work that you do is rooted in community. Mm. And it's rare that we see that nowadays. So I, um, 
I appreciate you so much. I appreciate you. And I'm so thankful for you. Same. And I'm so thankful for Mama Glow. And I'm so thankful that people have access to information. And I hope that all the information that you provide helps them make the best informed decision for their life, whatever that may be. But mm. just have the information. Bless you. 